you know about uh, Grace and Bruce and Michael Moronis and the situations that they have they have faced and uh, just the fact that um, just because they're young young men who enjoy a show that's typically for little girls are you know they're subject to ridicule. But this third one that most people probably have not seen. This is a young boy by the name of Barnaby. And Barnaby is seven years old, has not seen the things that these other two young men have seen, but he, he loves the show, and he loves Rainbow Dash, as you can tell. <laughs> but he knows, without ever being told, that he can't wear the shirt, or this, you know, this particular article of clothing, to school doesn't exactly know the reason why, but he just knows if he does, there's going to be problems. Why does a seven-year-old boy know that? That's, that's, that doesn't seem to make sense that, you know, not being told that, you know, that's wrong to wear, but just already has the feeling that if I wear this to school, there's going to be trouble. That's part of what my research does, and this is where I tie in a lot of my research now, and the gender studies, because it's not black and white. It's not just there's men and women, boys and girls. That dichotomy is gone. It's, it's never, it, frankly, has never existed. People do things differently and still identify themselves as male or female. But we do things that people often refer to as questionable. But that does not mean that you've lost your masculinity or your femininity just because you're involved in something. Case in point, uh, in recent decades, tomboys have become more acceptable, right? Yeah, we, we to a point though, usually young girls can be rough and tumble till about the age of 12. But as soon as they hit adolescence and they're still involved in those physical activities, we start to question things, right? Like, why are you still my favorite example is softball. Why are you still involved in softball? We all know what girls involved in softball are like. Is that true? No. Awesome. I need, I need to talk to her because uh, I need some arc welding done um, if I can get it done for an academic purpose. But <laughs> I'm working on that. But we have these notions. And as soon, and I guarantee you, there, there have been people who are staying in this hotel who have seen a number of you walk around carrying one of these cute little adorable plushies or looking like Pinkie Pie or whatever and be like, what's going on? Did we walk into Oz? I'm very frightened. <laughs> yeah. So the, it, but instantly the first question, this has always been a question uh, that I usually get right out of the gate when I start telling people about my research is, are they gay? Why is that the first question? Why is it as soon as you see a fan carrying around a pony, we then question sexuality? That's just how, how our society works. As soon as we as soon as we see someone who's disrupting gender norms, we start to question their sexuality. That's a lot of what my research is trying to do, trying to say, this is yes, they're disrupting things, but it does not do anything towards their sexuality or their gender in particular. They are still masculine or feminine. It's just this is something that's considered atypical but still acceptable. So, cool. So here's the boring theory part. I'm sorry, but I'm going to use Don Tiara's Silver Spoon and the Cutie Mark Crusaders to explain how this thing works. So you're going to be learning, but it's going to be cute. Um, part of how this works is this. We use this uh, notion called social identity theory, in which we as human beings create our own personal identity. I am Sam, you are you, you know, what, whoever you identify yourself to be. And that's within us. But then we also have a social identity. Yes, I'm Sam. I'm also, uh, I just happen to be a male. I'm also a professor at a university. 
uh, and I teach classes, and there's a whole lot of things that get constructed with that, just because of the associations. And as you can clearly tell, I don't look like a professor. This is how I normally dress. And eh, that's just how it goes. So that's how I've built my identity. Then there are the social categor categorizations. So we already have our personal identi identities with like, I'm Apple Bloom, I'm Sweetie Belle, I'm Scootaloo. My social identities, I'm an Earth, I'm a Pegasus, I'm a unicorn. Furthermore, they get categorized because they are not, um, they, what, the thing about the CMCs is they do not have their cutie marks yet. So they're young fillies. But because we create distinct social groups, we have these two. Uh, yeah, exactly. Boo. <laughs> Dom and Tiara and Silver Spoon. And their big thing about picking on the CMCs is the fact that they don't have their cutie marks. Like, They're not as cool as us, because we got spoons and tiaras. <laughs> so, so we will reject them, because they're not what we typify as the in-group. Yes. Right. Right. There you go. There you go. Now that is the now that is a chess piece to live up to, isn't it? I'm jealous of it. because um, then I wouldn't have to do what I do. Um, so we have these two groups constantly comparing each other and trying to, you know, work out who their group their just group identities and individual identities. Okay. Also, the, one of the theories that I like to throw in is gender identity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's not black and white anymore. It's not just boy, girl, man, woman. Uh, there is a whole spectrum of how genders can be identified. To the girliest of girly, like rarity. To the manliest of manly, like, okay, is it bulk biceps or is it snowflake? Who do you? <laughs> All right, bulk snowflake. Cool, I'm fine with that. Uh, so there's bulk snowflake and rarity and then everything in between because I've always often viewed those two as the extremes of gender. This rarity is the embodiment of femininity and bulk snowflake is just, yeah, masculinity that we've all come to know and love. Yeah. I'm actually surprised no one actually went, yeah, in the middle of the group. That makes me happy because I'm glad that meme's dying. But I this, <laughs> it'll probably happen. But as you can, as you see, like we all fall within the spectrum somewhere, and it always constantly changes. I mean, it's. I mean, people will think you know, in your younger days, you were might maybe more physical, whereas now you've might have changed to be more artistic. But because physicality is normally something that we consider masculine, you would tend to lean more towards that masculine side, whereas if you're not doing something nearly as physical, people would often view you as giving up some of your masculinity because you're not that rough and tumble kind of guy. And that's where gender identity falls in, this, fa this fact that it just has this, this fluidity. We can always change it no matter what. Okay. Uh, the last thing that I, wanted, that I talk about with theories is this notion of self-disclosure. And this is a big part of this initial research was the idea of self-disclosure. And what self-disclosure is, is the notion of what we're willing to tell other people about ourselves. I mean, there's varying levels of how self-disclosure works. I mean, 
most people are willing to tell you their name, where they're from, things like that. It's another thing to ask them more intimate questions, and you have to build a relationship over time, generally, to understand or to get that information. Because most people that you walk up to, maybe at this convention, and be like, oh, hi, I'm Sam, I'm from North Dakota, uh, my favorite pony is Rose Luck, and I'm the only person here that likes her, so I'm fine with that. Uh, I won't run into a fan who will say, oh, that's cool, my name's Derek, I'm from Minneapolis, and I'm so into Twilight that I'm planning to marry her next week. <laughs> uh, that's a little too much information for me, and that's, that's generally how, we, we would view that as too much information, right? TMI, right off the bat, because we haven't established some sort of initial relationship yet. I mean, that's almost too much information to self-disclose. Like, uh, but also on the, on the other side of the coin, there are people that are just very shy about things that they're into. You might know somebody who, for years, but do not know that they love Doctor Who, even though that seems like something that you might just come up. You know, I mean, it's nothing to be ashamed about, liking Doctor Who, and who doesn't? So that, that would be something that um, you would think is sort of silly. Like, well, you, I've known you for like 15 years. You never said you liked Tom Baker. Woo! Yes. Woo! Yes, Tom Baker for the win. You know, why didn't you tell me? I, I, I thought the scarf would be a dead giveaway, dude. No. <laughs> Maybe I'm just dense like that. I don't know. But it would, you, know, you would think that would be something that would come up in conversation. But it's interesting when it comes to this fandom. And it's something that came up uh, in my research uh, that some people just aren't willing to tell anybody that they like this show. Why? Well, it could be the fact that uh, you start getting weird looks. And when you say, oh, I watch My Little Pony, excuse me, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah, it's a cartoon show. Cute little horses talking about friendship, singing songs. Dude, you're 35. <laughs> um, um, you all right? Yeah, perfect. I actually feel better now than I have in years. But you're watching colorful horses why is there a rainbow colored horse in your, your shirt pocket? Um, I really like Rainbow Dash. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, you're 35, remember that, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm totally fine. You know, and so we get, sort of build this idea of shame. Like, I shouldn't be want. Why does everyone think it's weird for me to be watching this? It's just, a, it's just a show that I enjoy. So some people before that would even happen, won't tell a soul that they're just totally not comfortable letting people know. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I went to BronyCon and used this survey. Uh, I will actually be talking about this later as well. I have, uh, you also can participate in this survey because I've extended it out. And I've actually focused in some more questions to help me with my data set. So all of you are, uh, you're not obligated, but you can participate in this survey if you want. And there's also a lovely prize that you are, uh, that you have the chance to win by participating. But we'll talk about that when the time comes. So, thank you. So uh, in my research, this is the only wall of text. I hate wall of text. She knows this. I do not like walls of text within uh, PowerPoint. But when I did my initial survey, I came up with four hypotheses uh, that there was a relationship between disclosure and gender, that there was a relationship between disclosure and age, that there is a relationship between disclosure and the harassment of bronies, and that fans who self-designate as public bronies are more likely to attend brony meetups than self-designated private bronies. Okay, I want to get rid of that wall of text. I hate it. So I'd rather have this up instead. 
because this is more adorkable and I can handle it. Uh, because you have to generate these questions, otherwise academics are like, this isn't research. You're just playing with horses again, aren't you? <laughs> Shut up, man, yes I am. I'm doing academic research. It just looks cute. And they form this idea when they see his office. Oh, <laughs> thank you for referring back to my office, yes. Um, up until uh, one of my fellow cohort graduated with her masters, I shared an office with two young ladies, so there's three of us. Yes. Uh, yes. So we're in these offices. All right. Both of them have small children. Well, actually, no. One has small children. No one has, has older children. Um, and then there's me by myself, alone, forever, and it's cool. But I've got who do you think had the girliest desk? <laughs> Me. I have the girliest desk. I mean, they have pictures of their children growing up. They have pictures of their accomplishments in life. I've got that purple horse sitting on the desk. I've got artwork from uh, draw ponies, in fact. Um, uh, Hot Diggity Demon actually made me a sketch of Twilight as a professor, so it was actually tasteful, not his normal fare, <laughs> thankfully. Because I had met him in Omaha, and he's like, oh, you're doing that? That's really cool. Let me make you a sketch. Uh, you're a professor. You like that purple smart horse, right? Yeah. And he just made, made me a Twilight, and she looks like, she kind of reminds me of Donald Sutherland from Animal House, that kind of look. <laughs> so I'm like, that's actually my goal in life, is to look like him and be that kind of cool but I don't think I'll ever reach it. So I have the girliest desk. And when students that get invited, that are, have appointments with my, with my uh, other cohort come in, they usually have to stop. And like, wow, what is all this? Who's the girl that sits at this desk? <laughs> it's like, no, that's a dude. What? <laughs> because, I mean, it's just a wall of stuff that I've got from different conventions and whatnot that people have given me. Just like, dude, your research is really awesome and I re you know, really appreciate it. Have this poster. Cool. And it's just like, I can't put this in my apartment anymore. My apartment's kind of small. I'll just put it in my office. <laughs> and it just sits there and people just, wow. That's a lot of horsies. It is. And I'm cool with it. So, yeah. So in my own way, I'm, I'm fighting against gender because people automatically think, who's the girl at this desk and why does she still like My Little Pony? And no, it's a 35-year-old man and he likes the horses too. Cool. Uh, so uh, going over to the next slide. Uh, the results of the initial study. Sadly, I did not find any association between age, gender, and self-disclosure. And the reason why I... I figured out the limitation was this. I was in Baltimore. I was with 8,400 fans who were dressed up as every pony imaginable. I don't think they care. So I should have thought of that prior to the research, like, oh, they're just so into this that they don't care what other people think. And for those of you who are gonna go to BronyCon this year, downtown Baltimore did give a lot of people strange looks walking through uh, as ponies, but they really don't care. The fans really don't care. And it might just be the strength of numbers, I don't know, but most of them were just like, look, we are bronies, we are proud of who we are, and the rest of you can just give us the weirdest looks possible, we don't care. So, yeah, yeah. So that's where I think age and the age and gender question regarding self-disclosure sort of fell flat. Like, all right, all right. I realize I screwed that up. So when I checked out my other hypotheses, um, the teasing aspect, and this is, this, these two questions about teasing and meetup attendance is uh, helping foster my new theory that I'll talk about here shortly of um, why certain fans stay secretive as much as they do, uh, falls into this side. There was a lot of significance into it, like because fans did not want to face the potential teasing they wouldn't tell anybody. They were always worried about what their parents would say, 
what their coworkers would think, things like that. And additionally, when it came to the meetup attendance, which is really interesting, uh, public bronies were like, yeah, there's a meetup, cool, I'll go. Um, private bronies were like, yeah, they're into what I like, but I don't feel comfortable being around them. Okay, but what if you went with a friend? Maybe a little bit more, I'd be a little bit more intrigued to go, but not so much. That's very interesting, you know. Even though you, you, you're probably, as a brony, looking for, you know, like-minded people who are into the same things as you are, you would think that people would be more inclined to actually go to a meetup where more like-minded people would be. It's not necessarily the case. So those generated some really interesting questions as a result of all this. Uh, yeah, these wonderful things. Uh, and it's a result of what media representations have done to the Brony fandom. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this lovely segment. Uh, there was a, there's a thing on Bravo called What? Where they just, it's people on couches getting reactions about different things. Uh, th this one, they watched the Brony documentary uh, that was made by Brockoff in 20, what was it, 2012, 2013. Yeah. And for two and a half minutes, it's just people ridiculing fans in the worst possible way. And I'm like, really? Right. Like, I know they're probably engineering it toward um, generating ratings, but it was like, Really? This is what's going on? This is what you perceive it to be? Or my other favorite is... Uh I don't think you can say that without being it slanderous. <laughs> That's just like... I mean, it, it, it was rather painful, but these are the media, cons these are the media perceptions that, that bronies face. So it, there's already this generation of shame that the media is giving towards people who just happen to like cute little horses. Just, and the fact that you happen to be an older male only compacts it. Take for this sort of thing. Uh, oh, teasing, which leads fans to stay private. Yeah. Uh, and the meetup thing. I already, go ahead. Yeah, oh, I over talked again. <laughs> I'm an academic. I could be a little bit, you know, spaced out on the page. Oh, this part. <laughs> See, all I had to do was look at the picture, and it's like, all right, now I know where I am. So, as a result of the first, um, the first uh, survey and those questions about privacy. Because here's, here's one interesting statistic that came out of that initial survey. Out of the near 600 people that took the survey, there was a small percentage, about 12%, so around 60 or 70 people, who were at this convention said that they're still private. And not only were they private, uh, part of the demographics were they were coming from international over international waters to come to this event. Okay, you're saying that you don't tell a soul, but somehow you come across borders to Baltimore to celebrate all things pony. First question in my mind is how are you hiding that? Because that's that seems rather difficult. You might say, oh, I ha I have a job opportunity in the United States. Oh, by the way, three days, I'm gonna go to Baltimore. And, you know, indulge in my pony fandom. You know, however you would mask that. Because that's, that's, that to me would be really hard to legitimize that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm traveling, I'm coming over from Germany and, and I'm gonna go to Baltimore. Why? Um, uh, yeah, do I need a reason? I just wanna see America. You know, whatever reason you have to create, but you'd still kept it a secret because that's, that'd be kind of important. Like, you know, where's Mark? Oh, he's in the United States. Doing what? We don't know. He didn't tell us. 
And then he comes back and says, why is Mark wearing, is that a pink horse? <laughs> what do they do to you in America, Mark? <laughs> you know, so, you, you, you know, if they, if they spotted him with it, you know, he might keep it in his closet. Or I've actually had fans compare it to pornography. They'd rather be caught having, you know, mag porno magazines under their bed than, you know, catch, get caught with a Rainbow Dash screensaver or something. And that's like a really interesting comparison to me. Like, you'd rather be caught with something more embarrassing to me than, than having a pony out. Yeah, but the scary part is the porn is actually more socially acceptable. Right. That's the scary thing. Right. So, uh, as, yeah, as a result of all this analysis, I'm starting to develop this theory called the stable. And I, uh, it sounds corny as all get out, but it actually, gener it actually came out of the fandom itself. Uh, initially, fans who were va rather secretive about this, this love for the fandom, uh, they, s they called other people uh, stabled bronies. Like, they just did not come out of the stable uh, for enjoying this show. And um, as I'm generating this, I'm using a lot of queer theory. Uh, part of it is uh, Eve Sedgwick's epistemo epistemology of the closet. I love big words. Um, about how things like the closet are created. Uh, things like the closet serve as a speech act or a function. We, um, we maintain a silence because we have a shame for something that we enjoy, whatever it may be. In this case, ponies. So we have now generated ourselves a stable. Yes, the stable is a safe place. Um, it is a place where we can, we, we can be with ourselves and our ponies and enjoy ourselves without any kind of ridicule. But there's a problem with that. Most people who do not like bronies in all likelihood have never met one. So by keeping your own silence, not identifying yourself as a brony, not, not to the point that you're you know, shoving your broniness down their throat, because some people are pony zealots, and I'm cool with that, but you know, sometimes tact is important. So there's a balance you need to maintain. But when it comes to uh, the ones who want to remain private, it's, you know, I'm just not comfortable, you know, letting anybody know because they feel a shame about it. And it's like, why, how have we developed this shame for it? Because society tells us it's wrong? In all likelihood, yes, that we've been told Boys should be interested in baseball and trucks and everything else and firearms and blah, blah, blah. Like, America. Yeah, thank you, America. <laughs> Whereas if you engage in anything even remotely feminine, you know, like, like when I was growing up, I had a lot of, you know, cousins who were girls. I'm one of the only boys. So if I wanted to play, you know, have someone to play with, I got to play with the girls. So what do I have to play with? Barbie. My dad didn't care for it. But I'm like, Dad, I need someone to play with at the family function, so I've got to do it, you know? And I understand the sense of shame for, for the fans. Going back to my father. Um, <laughs> my father is a very blue-collar individual. He's been a hard worker all his life and has always told me, son, get an education. Well, I listened too well. <laughs> I'm like in my, I'm in my like eighth or ninth, ninth or tenth year of college. I, like that, I just won't leave. And he's just like, well, apparently you just don't want to, you just want to stay in college all your life? Yes, I do, dad. Okay. So he's never really understood anything that I've done in college, ever. And he's always been asking me, what is this going to get you? What is this going to get you? What is this going to get you? I don't know, dad. I like academia. Okay, um, so he just sort of rolled with it for the most part. He'll ask me a couple times, like, "What am I researching? What am I doing?" And he'll be, he'll be like, "Could you break that down?" I'm trying, Dad. I really am, but okay, fine. I just won't ask you again. Just shut up about it. Um, so when I when I got up to North Dakota and I started my research there, I was like, "Oh, so now that you're a PhD student." What highfalutin theories are you dealing with now? And what are you researching? My Little Pony. What? <laughs> <laughs> the 
excuse me? All right, all right, all right. Um, um, we, we, you're, you're a professor, right? Yeah, I teach classes. They pay you to be there, right? <laughs> yes, they do. All right. Um, they're cool with this, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, as long as you're not... Uh, fine. He, he's, he's slowly learned to... It's been like two years since I had to break this to him, and he's slowly accepted it. And he's just like, you're doing what now? You're doing what now? You're doing... And he's... he's He's getting, he's understanding. It's been a slow process for him because he's of a different era, and I understand that, that he's not, he's questioned a lot of things I've done with my life, and this one's just another one of that pile, but he's, he's slowly understanding it. But here's the thing. When I had to explain it to him, I felt that shame. It's like, I'm, I, in a weird way, I almost felt like I'm letting him down. Like, yeah, Dan, I'm in the ponies. Um... I hang around the fandom a lot. I like to see what they're doing. I ask some questions, and then I write some highfalutin theory behind it, and <laughs> af academia. It's like, oh my god, really? Oh no, all right, all right, all right. And I, I, I felt the same way. It was like really weird that, like, no, I'm the academic here. I'm the one who's supposed to be the, and I've been told this on more than one occasion, the brony expert, and I'm like, I'm just a dude who's falling around other dudes who are into ponies. If you okay, if that makes me an expert, so be it. But I don't. I, I felt a weird shame about it, and that's. I, how many of you have seen Saber Sparks' video about pony versus parents? A few of you. All right, that's part of what spurned on this because we now have to have videos. And. Uh, of how to actually confront your parents that you're a brony. Like you gotta do some sort of confessional ritual. Really, we need to go this route? Additionally, like what was it, last month when they had the McDonald's toys? EQD had an article about how to go to McDonald's and ask for the girl's toy. We need this now too? If anything, this is reinforcing, you know, I'm a brony and I'm ashamed. No, you're not supposed to be ashamed of what you like. You're never supposed to be ashamed of what you like, ever. So, well, things go black. Cool. Screensaver. Screensaver, cool. Um, so these are the things that I'm trying to combat, you know. So the stable does act as this safe harbor from the shame, but it also harbors it also fosters the ignorance that people just don't understand you because you remain silent. So I'm trying to flesh out this, this whole phenomenon so that being a brony is something that people should not be ashamed of. Because I've talked to a number of fans, and part of my research now is trying to you know, understand the practices, especially the private bronies, because like, what links will you go to uh, to stay private? You know. Have you told anybody at all? Or the only people you've told are people that you know on Pony Square, Pony Hoof, or whatever, you know, the online sites, or have you actually told another human being? Because that's another thing that I've noticed is a recent trend. People actually making dad I'm a brony videos. Really? We have to now document these things as like some sort of I mean, yes, they're important to know, but do they have to be like, I'm now freeing myself of this shame, and mom, dad, I'm a brony. It's like you're expecting some sort of weird shame act out of it, and like, no, no, you're a brony, you should embrace it, just flat out. So, with all that said, um, yeah. go ahead, yes. Uh, I am la I've launched my newest survey. I launched this at BabsCon already. But you can take part in it, too. Um, this is what will happen when you initially get it. They, how it happens is this. 
Uh, I have a bunch of business cards up here, uh, complete with Derpy, because Derpy is awesome. Best mother. Yes, it, best mother. No, Shaft is the best mother. Um, and only people over 30 will get that, and I'm cool with that. Uh, there is a QR code, so the people under 30 get that joke uh, reference. There's a QR code that you can scan with your smartphone, and it'll take you directly to the survey. And you'll know you'll be on the survey when you see Princess Celestia with all the legal mumbo jumbo because she's authoritarian. Yes. I have a website, and I have that all taken care of. Thank you. Um, on two su different sites, Facebook and Twitter. I don't like calling that a hashtag because that's not what it's called. It's called an Octothorpe, people. Hashtag. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else agrees with me. It's called an Octothorpe. Hashtag. Octothorpe. <laughs> anyway, not important, but... Um, UND Brony Study will take, you know, either on Twitter or Facebook, will get you there. And you just click on the link from there and you can take the survey. All right? It's 50 questions now, but with each picture, you get a different pony. That's important. So every, every question, you get a brand new pony to look at. Additionally, yes, I know 50 questions sounds like a lot. And then we'll ask you a, different, a bunch of different questions about where you're from, how old you are, what you're doing with your life, you know, some questions about media representations and whatnot, and uh, how you conduct your fandom, you know, you know how, how public are you about it, how private are you about it, who have you told, things like that. And if you are nice enough to do the survey, you could win, and it'd be in a drawing, to win a cute plushie. He makes these himself. Shh, I didn't want them to know that. Oh, whatever. I'm saddened by my student. No, you're not. Uh, you disappoint. She, she was. Yeah. She was my student. Part of her was. job is to embarrass you. <laughs> anyway. So... You, you, field the fifth, you handle the 50 questions, and then you, all you have to do is put in your email. At the end, one of the last questions is putting in your email address to, so that you can be in the drawing for the, um, for, the, for the plushie of your choice, within reason, because the OCs are a different story. Um, no princesses, princesses either right now, sorry. Um, but you would be able to get a plushie of your choice. Uh, so other than your email address, this is totally anonymous. Your name is not attached to this in any way, shape, or form. So all data about you, I mean, there's just, you're just, and it sounds kind of harsh, but you would just be a number to me until you win, you, if you won the plushie so that I can contact you. But all information is anonymous, and it will be kept anonymous. No one will know who you are and the information that you're giving me. So um, that is where I'm heading with this. Um, so other than that, uh, does anybody have any questions regarding my research or the survey or anything? Yes. Out of curiosity, is there been any correlation between, uh, public drones and military service? Ah, the military service question. Um, actually one of the questions in my survey asks you if you're a military brony, because I... Yeah. So... You guys have a special spot in my heart, man. Um, uh, so, yeah, I do ask the question about veteran status because I find that very important. Because I don't, for those of you who have ever been to a BronyCon or BabsCon, they actually have panels for military bronies. And it's very interesting to see guys and ladies, you know, dressed up in BDUs or really nice dress uniforms like their Class A's, um, embracing, you know, ponies. It's actually really awesome. And um, I mean, that's a clear uh, contrast. I mean, military is raw, raw masculinity, you know, bang, bang, shoot guns with Fluttershy. <laughs> hmm, that's not a contrast at all. <laughs> so how do you, how do you, yeah, yay, I shot down a tank. Right, and that's... Oh, 
Right. I, I've had a number of veterans tell me that very same thing. Like, I admire them because, especially in Army, I think the core values are leadership. I think that they use. Loyalty, they, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal Right. And they, they correlate those oftentimes to the ponies, and I find that very interesting. So that's been a, a wonderful thing that I, I, I've, I've found that a number of military bronies have told me. Yeah, you can't get much more masculine than that. <laughs> Coming out of the water with Marine. Marine. Oh, Navy, I don't remember these things. I was Army. I was stuck in a calm shelter all day. Yes, um, about those like, w like one of the questions is why are you secretive, and one of the one of the one of the some of the answers responses include, I'm afraid of what uh, my family would think. I'm afraid of what my friends would think. Uh, potentially, uh, side effects of work, and I do allow people to after they a answer that question, I have textual parts where they can actually give me illustration like tell me you know, as much detail as they want why they feel that it would be, it would be a problem if they did. Oh, uh, actually, Bono, uh, military, do you feel like you're, uh, so wait, um, oh, oh, okay. Uh, no, no, I don't have that. That is not one of my questions. Sorry. Uh, so you mentioned shame quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and you touched on a little bit. Shame is kind of a derivative of fear. Of right. Part of a minority group. Right. You got a history of us versus them. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the against the gender norm. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yes. Uh, this gentleman, and then I'll get over here. Go ahead. Uh, I only have one uh, that is that I've put I put out for people to see. Um, it's on my Google Docs, and I did not have a link for it. But that one was. It's it's not. It's not related to the gender issues that I ask. It's, it's to the, uh, that one was called What My Cutie Mark Is Telling Me. Because fans have this wonderful thing that they love to do with fan interpretation that has always fascinated me with, this, with, with ponies. Um, that one deals with um, basically the whole idea of the cutie mark itself and how fans construct identity through um, cutie marks. My, like one of my favorite examples is Derpy. Um, really, what was Derpy? Three seconds of, a, of an animation error. And what did the fans do within a month? Created a name, gave her, gave her name, gave her a job, gave her a child, gave her an entire family. You know, like, really, from three seconds, you guys all created that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So exactly, like Vinyl Scratch is another great example. Put a rec put a needle to a record, and boom! All of a sudden, it's all about the wubs. It's amazing what you guys do. But that's the only other thing that I would have that's actually open to public reading. Right now. Right now. Yeah. Uh, there were two questions over here, and then I'll get to you. Uh, you in the front. Um, I've been playing Rag and Simon survey. Oh, the. Okay, the survey. Uh, the business cards have QR codes, or if you go on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, Octothorpe, uh, UND Brony Study. Hashtag. Yeah, hashtag. So one of those will get you to the, the, the survey, and you'll know you'll found it when Princess Celestia is right there in your face with all the legal stuff. Yes, you and the yellow ears. Yeah, that's the only thing, and that's just fan interpretation stuff. This gender stuff is relatively new. I actually just sent the uh, final version of my this article about my research last year 
to a to a journal to be reviewed. And I'm working on the stable, my stable theory right now. As soon as I get back to North Dakota, that's what I'm working on. So, oh, academics are so slow. Um, yeah, at least six months, if 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 they accept it, because they might look at it. horses, <laughs> and then I'll never see it again. And then I have to ship it, you know, I have to ship it to somebody else to, you know, try to get it published. Because some people in academia are very picky about what they see in their journals. And if cute, cute little horses are in their journal, that might hurt their reputation. <sighs> Academics are so weird. Uh, yeah, after the panel, I'll try to find it. And uh, then you can, because I don't even remember the link of it. So, yeah, I can get you. It's, it's public. You can see it. But I, Google Docs is just something that I just threw it in, so I don't even know where it's at right now. We can copy and paste. Yeah, but we can copy and paste it something like that. Yes, you who have been so patient. Ooh, ooh, good question. Uh, my data can break down that far. Um, I guess. Okay, I, I think in per capita, not surprisingly, it's the Midwest um, where most people are very private about it. Cause, and I, I always think about the, the, the documentary, the, the Brony documentary, uh, where uh, that one young man was from North Carolina and he had a, um, he had a friend who was saying, uh, it's not easy being a Brony in the Appalachian Mountains I'm from the Appalachian Mountains. I can attest to that because there are quite a few weird looks when they see me wearing Fluttershy on my shirt. And they're like, what is this dude doing? He shouldn't get gas here. He should go to the next town. You know, those, those sort of things. So, yes, uh, I have seen it per capita uh, happen more in the Midwest than on either coast. Um, oh, I got two minutes? Sweet. Uh, there, I think there was one over here. How many do I got left? One? Okay, just the last question then? Cool. Um, yeah, that's always been a question because the other question I get is, am I a brony? Um, the way that I, I phrase brony is this. Someone who is between the ages of 13 and older who thoroughly enjoys the show. I don't care what their gender is. I just care, do they really enjoy the show? And by when I say really enjoy the show, at least watches the episodes. Anything else is, I mean, some people just maybe don't want the merchandise for whatever reason, but they actually really love the show. I've actually, pardon, have never heard of somebody who's actually like, oh, I love the show, but I don't want to call myself a brony. Now I know when that term Pegasister came out, not a whole lot of people, not a whole lot of ladies were thrilled with it. Like, no, I'm a brony. So I've never, I've never really heard somebody like, I don't want to be called a brony. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could get that. I just don't want to be associated with a fandom that can be so out there. But mm -hmm. at the same time, if you enjoy the show, yeah. I kind of have a dichotomy. Yeah, it is a difficult I balance. Right. 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 It's not even that you really have to be included. It's just kind of something that people do. 
Um, it is essentializing, and I'm I'm actually one of those people who does does not like to essentialize. But that is one of my key questions right off the right off the bat. Do you consider yourself a brony? And then everything diverts from there. So it's not like like I have to say that I'm a brony just because I'm taking this survey. It's like I can identify myself as either being a brony or not being a brony. So it's not like I mean j just because somebody enjoys the show and maybe has a few things is not. You know, and they don't want to call themselves a brony. That's totally fine. That's why I have the survey engineered that way, so that you know some people really don't like labels, and I totally understand that. So, it it's just, and I, I agree with you. I don't I, I don't agree with labeling a whole lot, and I don't like essentializing. And I've just gotten the signal to cut off. But, um, I will say this: thank you for all of your time. Uh, thank you for coming and listening to me. It's been a pleasure. Um, if you want to take the survey, I, uh, I do have a bunch of business cards right here. I encourage you to spread the word about these. And yes? Yeah. Okay. Spread the word about these. You know, after you've scanned it and uh, you're done with it, you know, pass it off to a friend. The more the people that take this, the better, I'm, better off my data is. I missed most of your thing. Um, uh, what's your name and what do you do again? I'm Sam Miller. groups we have these two uh, yeah exactly boo <laughs> diamond tiara and silver spoon and their big thing about picking on the cmc's is the fact that they don't have their cutie marks like They're not as cool as us, because we got spoons and tiaras. <laughs> so, so we will reject them, because they're not what we typify as the in-group. Grace and Bruce and Michael Moronis and the situations that they have they have faced and uh, just the fact that um, just because they're young young men who enjoy a show that's typically for little girls are you know they're subject to ridicule. But this third one that most people probably have not seen this is a young boy by the name of Barnaby, and Barnaby is seven years old, has not seen the things that these other two young men have seen. But he, he loves the show, and he loves Rainbow Dash, as you can tell. <laughs> but he knows, without ever being told, that he can't wear the shirt, or this, you know, this particular article of clothing, to school. He doesn't exactly know the reason why, but he just knows if he does, there's going to be problems. Why does a seven-year-old boy know that? That's, that's, that doesn't seem to make sense that, you know, not being told that, you know, that's wrong to wear, but just already has the feeling that if I wear this to school, there's going to be trouble. That's part of what my research does, and this is where I tie in a lot of my research now into the gender studies, because it's boring theory part. I'm sorry, but I'm going to use Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon and the Cutie Marker Satyrs to explain how this thing works. 
So you're going to be learning, but it's going to be cute. Um, part of how this works is this. We use this uh, notion called social identity theory, in which we as human beings create our own personal identity. I am Sam, you are you, you know, what, whoever you identify yourself to be. And that's within us. But then we also have a social identity. Yes, I am Sam. I'm also, uh, I just happen to be a male. I'm also a professor at a university, uh, and I teach classes, and there's a whole lot of things that get constructed with that, just because of the associations. And as you can clearly tell, I don't look like a professor. This is how I normally dress. And that's just how it goes. So that's how I've built my identity. Then there are the social categorizations. So we already have our personal identi identities with like, I'm Apple Bloom, I'm Sweetie Belle, I'm Scootaloo. My social identities, I'm an Earth, I'm a Pegasus, I'm a Unicorn. Furthermore, they get categorized because they are not, um, they, what, the thing about the CMCs is they do not have their cutie marks yet. So they're young fillies. But because we create distinct social soon, and I guarantee you there, there have been people who are staying in this hotel who have seen a number of you walk around carrying one of these cute little adorable plushies or looking like Pinkie Pie or whatever and be like, what's going on? <laughs> Did we walk into Oz? <laughs> I'm very frightened. <laughs> yeah, so the, it, but instantly the first question, this has always been a question uh, that I usually get right out of the gate when I start telling people about my research is, are they gay? Why is that the first question? Why is it, as soon as you see a fan carrying around a pony, we then question sexuality? That's just how, how our society works. As soon as, we, as soon as we see someone who's disrupting gender norms, we start to question their sexuality. That's a lot of what my research is trying to do, trying to say, this is, n yes, they're disrupting things, but it does not do anything towards their sexuality or their gender in particular. They are still masculine or feminine. It's just, this is something that's considered atypical, but still acceptable. So, cool. So here's the, not black and white. It's not just there's men and women, boys and girls. That dichotomy is gone. It's, it's never, it, frankly, has never existed. People do things differently and still identify themselves as male or female. But we do things that people often refer to as questionable. But that does not mean that you've lost your masculinity or your femininity just because you're involved in something. Case in point, uh, in recent decades, tomboys have become more acceptable. Right? Yeah, we... we to a point, though, usually young girls can be rough and tumble till about the age of 12. But as soon as they hit adolescence and they're still involved in those physical activities, we start to question things, right? Like, why are you still, my favorite example is softball. Why are you still involved in softball? We all know what girls involved in softball are like. Is that true? No. Awesome. I need, I need to talk to her because uh, I need some arc welding done um, if I can get it done for an academic purpose. But I'm working on that. But we have these notions. And it's